Well, Alexander, I've gone through all my stuff, and I've looked and I've looked, and the car has been cleaned out, um, and Pegasus is nowhere to be found. And so I've, I've been avoiding this, but it's time to come up with her replacement. Now, I could just do a simple real people uh, character card draw in order to replace Pegasus with the group, because we do need eight. Um, however, I think uh, there's, there's another way I want to do it. And that involves nuts. We keep getting nuts, which is like the lemons that life is giving us. So let's turn those lemons, those nuts, so to speak, into nut aid uh, by playing a nuts game. Um, the winner of which will get to be our new person. So let's take a look at how we're going to do that, because I'm not even quite sure myself. Here's the nuts game in question. The Procroclean? Procroclean. Wars. I should look up the pronunciation on that before I massacre it again and again, or I could just massacre it again and again because that's what this game is going to be. Um, this game doesn't look too complicated, but it is going to be my first time playing, and so you'll get to see me be all too human and make lots and lots of mistakes, and probably even more than usual. Um, it's a hex encounter game. I've played a few of these, but not so many, and um, so we'll see how I do. So. It, it involves very small sides, which is nice for me. Um, and so what I thought I would do is for each unit uh, on each side, I'm going to give them um, a person who's been eliminated from the tournament so far, who's in the loser's pile. So those people are going to have other opportunities to come back through outdoor survival and careers, but here is going to be like a little bonus opportunity that they get. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. And then, you know, from who's surviving, we're going to decide uh, who gets to join uh, the group right here. And hopefully, um, by working our way through these nuts, the next time we domesticate plants in Origins, How We Became Human, which will probably be this coconut palm here, we will get something other than nuts. So I'd like to do a quick overview of the game for those of you who are not interested in the real people stuff um, before getting started with that aspect of it. So you could just watch the quick overview, see what the game's about, and then um, stop watching. So the game's a fairly small uh, hex encounter game. Very small, actually. A limited number of units here are pretty much though it's all one side's units right there. All these purple, that's the other side. So very few. It makes it good for real people because what I want to do is something I've been wanting to do but I haven't done before is I want to assign each unit a different person so that's going to be a lot of um, record keeping on my part but also I digress um, so it's fairly simple the rules are very simple you know you have movement points you have attack values defense combat's really quick there's nothing really with morale uh, except for this side they will move towards the west if they're injured um, uh, 10 turn game whoever has the most points at the end wins, uh, points are awarded based on uh, certain uh, holding certain locations. Points are also awarded based on whether or not these novel markers are played. So there's a number of different ways that the game injects flavor. And I can't speak to how successful these are because I haven't played the game yet, but just from reading the rules. So one way is, um, the there, well there's two sides. There's the gargantua side, I think they have a different word. Um, or what their side is called. I call them the Gargantua side because they're kind of headed up by Gargantua. And Gargantua is the fellow that the, the novel is, he's the name, the, the title character of the novel Gargantua, which this game is from. I know nothing about the novel uh, except that it's older. Um, it's French. And there's some war at some point in the novel, but you can kind of get a feel for some of the characters based on their special powers because, yes, the leaders have special powers, and that's another way that the game um, injects flavor into what's otherwise a very simple war game. So, for example, Gargantua himself is invincible, which is very rare for uh, a war type game. I've never played a game where there's just an invincible unit. So Gargantua can't be hurt. This guy here, Frere Jean, he, um, he does something, I forget what his power is, but it has to do with, like, if someone wants to enter here, they have to roll a die, and if they, they fail, they get hurt, and there's a bunch of stuff having to do with vineyards and all that stuff. Um, you know, and the, the main guy of the bad guys, where is he? I, I think he's a bad guy because... His power is if he's in a castle, a particular castle, and I forget which one it is, he can roll a die and get reinforcements. But if the die gets a certain roll, 
he kills one of his own leaders. So I don't know what that's about, but it's probably something to do with the novel. So the the different powers of the the leaders is one, another way that it injects uh, injects flavor. Um, these novel markers, these have certain effects um, that the gargantua player gets to decide when they do. They they get a, they can either play one of them around or not play them and do something else. Um, but if they don't play them, these are worth points to the the purple side, the per, per crocol percocaline per side uh, at the end of the game. So it's better for them to play them, but and some of them are positive for Gargantua and some of them aren't. Um, so that's another way that injects flavor. And the final way is there is in, an event table that both both sides are going to roll on. So the PK and the GK here, they each have different um, effects there. So, fun little game. I think it's, it's a, a perfect game for me, I think. I, it seems like it has a lot of flavor. Um, a lot going on, and I can assign them all real people, which is great. So let's talk about how I'm going to assign people. So first of all, um, I'm going to just assign Snugbug right off the bat. Snugbug, for those of you who have been following the Pablo Origins, Battle Station sort of connection that I've uh, been going with and which this Picrocolian Wars was part of, uh, know that Snugbug, especially if you've been following the Battle Station side, Snugbug has has been working with the crew of the Pablocklin Wren. Um, and so I feel like he should get, uh, he should, and he's also in the loser's bracket of, of the tournament. So I feel like he should get grandfathered into this game. Um, I would like him to be Gargantua because Snugbug is all about personal safety and all about uh, being comfortable and Gargantua can't be hurt. So I think it's like, it's, it's almost a perfect character for him to be. So I'm just going to go ahead and pick him. Um, beyond that, I'm going to draw randomly, I think, from the loser's bracket side. I think I'm going to exhaust this pile, though, and so then I'll turn to the the general pile. And when I draw a person, they get a pick. Now, there are certain certain characters and units that are going to be um, going to be more attractive, and so those are the ones that are probably going to get picked first. So Curly, um, along with Snugbug, I actually just picked him out of the deck. I didn't draw him randomly. I just thought, when I start, when I was thinking about Pick Crow Cole, um, I walked to the grocery store before this, and I was reading the rule book on the way. Um, when I was thinking about Picrocol, I just thought it seemed like such a curly character. So a lot of times I like to choose randomly and find the connections between um, characters, because, you know, basically we're, we're triply overlapping characters here. We have Picrocol, who's played by Curly, who's played by me. But in this case, I just I just felt like they were there was such a strong connection. I wanted to just to just do it. So, Curly is going to be there. For those of you who don't know who Curly is, he's from the um, Habsburg leg of the tournament. Uh, was involved in Middle Earth Quest and then this this epic game of Return of the Heroes and Helden in der Unterwelt, um, a fabulous dark lord. And so, I'm not even sure if that's how Picrocol is, but he has a little bit of that in him. So. Curly, yes. I'm not going to go into full depth on my, my choosing process, but there was a couple interesting choices here. Um, Twigmar was the first random draw. He chose Frere Jean, so Frere Jean is, he, I, you know, as near as I can tell, Frere Jean's job is to just kind of hang out by here, and if, if anyone goes there, he gets to, um, he gets a chance of just getting rid of them or hurting them but there's also a chance he can get captured. It doesn't seem like, it seemed, well, he, he adds a lot to any stack he has. If they lose, he's automatically captured. So it seems like there's an interesting choice with him whether to be passive by this Abbey or else active. And maybe this is where he's supposed to be, actually. I'm not sure. I'll have to relook at, uh, at setup or active and, um, you know, hope not to lose. So he chose that. Red Tomato chose Jim Nasty or Jim Nast. I don't uh, Gymnast. Um, Gymnast has a really cool power. What he can do is, if he's next to a stack once per game, he can roll a die, and if he gets a certain roll, he kills everyone um, just by himself, I think. I, I'd have to double check that. But if he fails, he's captured. So he has that kind of fun, fun thing. He gets to do a very swashbuckling red tomato sort of character. He nabbed that up. I didn't even have to think about it. Um, since I'm filming, let's, let's just do the random draw because I know how much you'd love it. Love to watch me draw cards. Oh, I dropped someone. They don't get to, they're going to miss this this chance. I'm not going to pick them up. Ooh, this is Dick, right? Yeah, Dick. 
Okay, so we have two Android guys and two Return of the Heroes guys. Oh, another thing with Red Tomato, he definitely didn't want to be in Curly's team. Dick was the first one to pick a non-leader character. He felt like they were not very attractive. Um, he prides himself on his physical appearance and his um, appeal to women. So he chose a knight. Um, as I was choosing, as, as that choice was being made, I realized there's over... A, there's like 55 counters, I think, was my quick count. I did not want to do that many people. So as you can see, I already have quite a few to deal with. I know it's a small counter um, set game. There aren't that many counters, but uh, to have an individual for each, I was maybe biting off a little more than I can chew. I was starting to put little scraps of paper on each one to mark who was who, but uh, I'm just going to have each character either be a leader or um, a type. So, so let's go through. Well, first of all, it was it was an interesting kind of blast from the past. Um, several blasts from the past going through this. Um, a lot of characters from Imperial 2030, which was my first game that I did for the Real People Multigame Solitaire Magic Tournament. We have Hair Bear here, um, uh, Chappie was perpetually broke, and Bird all from that. Um, not, not a lot from Ideology, which was, I think, my second one. I think Cupid Doll is the only one from Ideology that I couldn't remember. Sid, I could not for the life of me remember where she was from. I had to go check through videos and, like, try and find some picture of her. She was from Betrayal at the House on the Hill. I don't think she did much. I feel like it didn't didn't go well for her. A lot of people from that um, that Return of the Heroes game, as you can see, Mooney and Red Tomato got reunited. Um, Red Tomato, he we already talked about who he is. Mooney ended up, he's one of the last to pick. He's just the pikeman. Um, so he's kind of the standard infantry. These guys right here. Uh, for the side, but that's nice that they get to work side by side. Um, too bad he can't be a horseman because I think it's the horseman that that um, Jim Nast, Jim Nasty, which I want to call him, uh, gets to do a special power if he's linked with him. Everyone from Battlestar Galactica who has not continued in the tournament is is with us. A lot of people from Android. No, not a lot. Two, two, right? Yeah, I think two people from Android. Um, and that's, you know, yeah, Vaughn, she's from fairly recently, but yeah, so just a, a few, select a few games, even though I, I probably drew over half the stack here, um, you can just take a blast from the past, uh, da, da, da. oh, so these two, they were in the Return of the Heroes game, um, Chopper, I would have liked to see him again, yep, there we go. So I, I babbled for a while, uh, <laughs> getting all nostalgic. I thought I'd go over just who people picked and why. Cupid Doll, and this isn't the order they picked in. Um, I was doing it kind of differently. I left some space because I thought I was going to have more than one horseman, for example. Um, but then I filled in the space later when I decided not to do that. Cupid Doll, she picked the big, powerful cannon. Um, I think the Picrocoline side, they get they have two of those, uh, 932. One of them is in this stack here. I haven't finished setting up the Picrocoline side. The um, Gargantua side is all set up, however. Most of their stuff is in reinforcements. So I think it's a case where they're outnumbered, but they kind of have some special tricks up their sleeve. They have a lot more special abilities. And um, the Picrocoline side, they're, they have a worse morale. They will run away if they're injured. So um, there's asymptomatic. There's some nice asymmetry there, which I like. Um, Smiley, I think the pikeman was probably the last choice for her, I feel like. Um, Sid picked Engoulevent, which was this guy here. Why did she pick him? I think she just wanted to pick a leader. Maybe that was who was left. Um, Bird went with the, the traitor, Touca Delon. Uh, and that, for, forgive me my... my um, pronunciation, but it's fun to try. The uh, reason why he did that is because he has this uh, go-with-the-flow kind of attitude bird. And Tuca de Long, if he gets captured by someone, he'll just go on to their side. He can go back and forth. And he's not a bad leader, so Bird was like, yeah, okay, that's probably what Bird would do. Um, Vaughn went with the other cannon. I think, again, that was there wasn't a lot left. Now, Weeder chose the gun purposefully. Um, and it was cool. Right after I drew Weeder, I drew Scoots. Um, those of you who remember, they have a little bit. I mean, they don't totally get along. They have a history. Um, so they each chose the gun side on opposite sides. So they might be shooting at each other. Um, Tater chose Ruckal Denard 
Rekha Donard, who's the, the leader who starts on the board here. He's in a weird opening situation. He has too many guys. <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't need the stacking rule, so he has to shed some weight um, in the first turn here. Um, and let's see. Da, 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 da. Nine ball, Trepaloo, another leader. Okay, on the other side, we kind of went over these guys. Hair Bear went with the big, tough Odemon, and that was an early shoot choice. Um, Odemon is that guy there. He had two swords that seemed appealing to Hair Bear. Hair Bear thinks of himself as a tough man, and that's because he is. Um, mustache or no. Let's see, Chappie is the horseman. Um, I did that because. There's not really any economics, but the horsemen, I figure, are going to charge for it. They have a higher movement than everyone else, and Chappie is economically reckless, so I went with that. Um, Watermelon was... She actually, I chose before I knew that she was going to represent all of them, so she actually chose this particular cannon over here. She did not want to be part of the battle, so she's like, okay, I'll be this guy here. But then later on, you know, now she has to be all of them. Oh, and there's an extra cannon. They have a 932. I didn't realize that. I think I'm just going to give that to Watermelon, too, because I think they only have... They only have three cannons, so those will all be watermelon. Um, I realize people are probably getting certain unfair advantages uh, by having these particular things. Uh, certain things are probably have a better chance of survival than others, like Gargantua, who cannot die. Um, so there we go. So I just started, and this really doesn't have anything to do with the real people or any choices anyone made, but I just find this a hilarious way that the game starts. So the first thing that happens in the game, this guy starts right here. The first thing that happens in the game with how the rules are written is this guy starts running away through the woods. So I don't know why that cracks me up, but that's just the way the game begins. And there we go. Lots of great little narratives in this game. So I, I, I touched on this before, but I was kind of, uh, I, sort of forgotten what, what the rules were. I didn't sleep much last night, but I also just forgot. I'm forgetful. Um, so how this works is in order to go through this area, and you see how the board starts. So the Gargantua people are way up here, and they have all these areas here which are um, dis which are nice to have, but they only have, they have very sparse defense. Um, but the main road through there goes through this abbey. They can't go through the abbey though, and you get a movement bonus if you stay on the road. So you know, if they can get through the abbey, they can cruise right over there before the gargantua people can get down. That's the idea. But in order to get through this abbey here, they have to stop here and then roll a die. If they, as long as this this friar is there, in these vineyards, vineyards, um, if the die roll is one to four, then they get hurt and they have to stay there. If it's five or six, then he goes to the Grand Goussier, which is this kind of invincible space, and he has to stay there until Gargantua comes. Uh, so I don't know what's going on. I think he's just kind of um, maybe trying to talk them out of coming, or maybe he's offering them wine. Maybe that's the narrative from the book, but uh, there's, there's. Uh, I just wanted to, I'm going to try and point out these little like narrative um, areas in the game because I think that's what makes this game and many others uh, interesting. Curly has some smileys under here and he's ordering one of them to go test the waters up there. He's gonna send this guy right up there. Um, I thought about it and Smiley decided she'll do it this one time. She's gonna, she's gonna, ha it's not gonna be a thing where he gets to just tell people to do it though. They get to decide each time if they want to do it or not. Um, they do want their side to win, because even if they survive, if their side doesn't win, they're out. So she's going to go up there. She has to stop and roll. She's got a four, so this smiley got hurt. Not good. After explaining to her the reorganization rules, she agrees to send some more up there. So thing is, is if, if he goes to that space after all of them, um, he can just fix them back up so that... No, oh, another one gets hurt. Does he dare send his cannon there? His dear cannon? Does the cannon... Uh, I don't think Cupid Doll wants to go there. Um, because she would have to stop there anyway. She wouldn't even get to go forward. So I don't think she can even trigger the effect. From Sid's group here, another smiley went up there. He's going to try again. Get through Frere Jean. And that's a five. So that's going to send Frere Jean to Grand Goussier. And I guess this one can keep going. One, two, three, four. And just stop there, I guess. And the gargantuan side of the turn was pretty straightforward. Just a lot of moving 
forward trying to get things they might get shot up they have to choose um, either now to roll a die and repeat the phase that the die lands on or take one of these I think they're gonna take one of these because uh, which one is it I think it's maybe the letter I'll have to find out which one it is but there's one that that is necessary to bring gargantuan and all the reinforcements in so it, it doesn't even come in till it, it doesn't allow them to come in till three um, turns later so I don't see why you wouldn't do it right off the bat maybe there's a reason but it seems like the most obvious thing to do so we'll do it something curly failed to explain to smiley um, her her people are not going to be repaired until next turn um, turn two if they happen to be with with him at that time she's a little she's smiling but that there's there's a little bit of um, a little bit of betrayal behind that smile whoa we just did the first events phase it, it starts on turn two we're in turn two of the game right now um, the Picrocoline player rolled they have to choose one of their leaders to die that person is not going to be able to advance so let's take a look at their choices Picrocol, which is curly that's not probably going to be their choice Engoulevon which is Sid Toca Dillon which is Bird the the traitor the possible traitor but he's he's stronger than some of the other ones Raka Denard, which is Tater, as in Tot, and Trepalu as in Nine Ball. So let's get them out here so we can see which one of these um, birds right here. Nine Ball, sorry, you fell down. That's going to be a tough choice. Stand up, bird. All right, so here are our all of our leaders. I think this is how we're going to do it. Um, since Curly has picked. Crocol, I, I presume he's the leader of all of them. Okay, so I think he is going to be um, not eligible to be murdered in this fashion, the death of a leader. I guess it's old age. A lot of the leaders look kind of old. So maybe it's old age or disease or something that they're dying for. It's certainly not um, conflict because there is no, no fighting going on yet. Um, and they're each going to get one secret vote. I don't think I'm, I'm going to mess with it being public. Everyone's just going to vote secretly. And then whoever has the most votes is going to die. Yeah, here we have the first round of voting. So the people on the left are the people who are voting. The people on the right are the people they voted on to die. Um, so if, if you look at that and you um, tally it up like I have, you can see that there is a tie. Uh, there are two votes for Nine Ball and two votes for Bird. So I think Sid is going to have to be the tiebreaker. Um, and I'm going to play it so they don't know who voted for who. Um, it was all tallied up by a third party. And it certainly makes the game less interesting in some ways. Bird is gone. The traitor is gone. That would have been fun to see what happened with that. But I had to go with who people would choose, and that's who they would choose. Right, we're about to have our first combat of the game. Some interesting uh, notes uh, in terms of this, this last movement phase. Um, Nineball, he went on to the fleeing soldier, so he is going to try and fix him up at the end of this round and bring him back into the fold. Um, Tater has in touch. She left the, sh the chateau, no, uh, castle there, and she is heading on these two here. I forgot um, that uh, Smiley's people are going to have to run away, even if they were stacked with a leader. So she's going to try and bring them back in the fold before they get to the edge. If they leave the map, they're gone. So Piccolo is in his castle of death here with um, some soldiers. Uh, looks like, who are they? Uh, he's got a couple smileys and a weeder there. And he is going to be um, doing, he's going to be attacking this other chateau, De La Roche Chermoche. Oh, there's two La Roche. I wonder if it's the, sh I think he has to get here to, to actually cause the death. So yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, so he's going to try and get rid of that guy and so he can start uh, bringing in reinforcements and risking the other people's lives, um, the other leaders' lives. So, so he's looking for 9 plus 1d6 minus 7 has to be higher, has to be 6 or higher, I believe, or higher than 6. All right, and a 6 is an automatic success, so that is going to bring the guy down 1. Uh, then he's going to do it again, except this time it's 6 plus 1d6 has to be higher than 6. No, that's not going to do it. And he gets one more shot because he has three guys there. 
There, that's going to get rid of the guy there. Ouch. So some poor calculations here, um, and we're seeing just how hard it could be to to um, take over a space. So here, this lone this lone Mooney here has defended off all of these horsemen. Uh, the idea was, and you know, I was just kind of making decisions without doing any sort of calculations. That's what I normally do, which sometimes <laughs> leads for, to some really ridiculous situations like this one. Um, all these knights came up and are attacking this little tower, but they can't get in it because they have to roll a six. And that's the only way they can beat them, just because of how the math works out. Um, so Mooney's Aqualad has just successfully defended off three dicks and a um, Goulevin, which is Sid. So the GK, um, the Gargantuan Kingdom, I think they have a different name, <laughs> but it's GK. Uh, they've, they've been counterattacking not too bad. They hurt one of these knights over here, and they've gotten rid of a unit here. So now, um, now Scoots is taking a shot at Weeder. Now her, her chances aren't the best. It's five against uh, four, so let's see what she gets. Five minus four is one, so she's got to get a five or better. That's a six, and that is going to... Alright, so the Grand Goussier, I don't know really what he's up to, but first he wrote a letter to um, alert Gargantua and these people that there's something going down here. So I, I feel like they're heading that this way to come help. Now he's going to do a mediation. Um, which basically what that means is that next turn these guys are not going to be able to attack the GK player. So he's, it seems like he's playing both sides. I don't know if he's some like a power monger or what, but I know his space here can't be touched. Um, you can't hurt the Grand Goussier's space. So I'll take a look at the, um, well, it's the Grand Goussier's kingdom. So this is the Grand Goussier's kingdom. It's not the Gargantua kingdom. I don't know why there's, maybe someone's done a mediation on there, on the Grand Goussier, so the Grand Goussier can't attack. I don't understand. Maybe they're just trying to, to, to offer an olive branch to the Picrocolines. Uh, we'll see.